Hi, I'm here. Awesome. We get to see you, right, Maisa? Quick... Yeah, I'll be on screen in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'm eating my breakfast. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Um, I just wanted to give you a quick time check of 1010. I know folks are still um, trickling in, so no problem, but just so you know um, what time it is. Hello, Steve Marshall. How do you do? I work at the State Department. It's a pretty cool guy. They're members of the I mean, that could be like free radicals. What's your What's your connection? I I'm this guy. I'm this person. He's still connected. A fascinating part. I know the organizers about what you know. I got the deal about those. I'm actually the uh, staff arts biologist at the CSB Association. Good press interest to be a person on the I love that comparison, <laughs> but I will clarify it is not like brain surgery. What's Rockville doing yeah, next week, see. Monday and Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday, yeah. 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 I think it is. Hello, I'm having a day where <laughs> I don't think you have I don't EC users not the big fun <laughs> And you have to in the in, in Hey, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone here at the beautiful old state house. And to those of you listening in, uh, welcome. This is the first meeting of the Connecticut Semi-Quincentennial Commission. It took me six months to learn how to say that. But I think I'm finally there. But for reasons like that, we will heretofore call it America 250, <laughs> with everyone's permission. I'm Denise Merrill, former Secretary of the State of Connecticut. I've worked with many of you, and I thank you for coming. I especially love being here in person, personally, because <laughs> uh, I haven't been for a long time. And so it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, very fitting that we are here at the old State House, and I just want to quickly introduce Sally Whipple, uh, director of the Democracy Center, which is housed here and will figure in our deliberations at some point. But I wanted Sally to just start by, you know, giving us a little welcome to the old State House and telling us a little bit about some of the things that I think are really kind of emblematic of the kind of things we want to see happening in our state. So go ahead, Sally. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the Old State House before, it's the 1796 capital of Connecticut, and it was in play as a capital for quite a while. So if you get a chance later and you want to look around the building, um, we have the Senate and House upstairs, which are restored to the early and late 19th centuries. This is the courtroom where the Amistad Africans were tried, um, and Prudence Crandall's trial was also held in this building. So it plays a really important role in history, nationally, internationally, and of course in Connecticut. 
And it was in this building that constitute the first Connecticut Constitution, the Constitution of 1818, was created. And it was on this site that Thomas Hooker um, gave the sermon that eventually inspired the fundamental orders of Connecticut. So the site itself has a very long history. Today, I always think of the old state house as the place where civics and history meet. So we have sort of a dual mission to just inspire people to be um, kind of like the um, Connecticut um, social studies, um, let people know enough that they can take informed action and use their voices um, to change the world if that's what they like to do. So here we give historical context for current um, issues and we do programs that are more or less history focused on Connecticut wide history, but we also inject civics and civic engagement into that. So I'll just mention um, three different things. We do school groups and tours and public programs. We also run a program called Connecticut's Kid Governor where fifth graders from across the state um, campaign and vote for a kid governor. We just had our elections last week and the winner will be announced on the 22nd. That governor and his or her cabinet um, of the seven runners up will um, govern Connecticut fifth graders for a full year. Um, they'll be inaugurated in January through an inauguration ceremony that we have in this room. And it is a really wonderful chance for kids to learn about government and learn about the importance of voting. We had 9,000, over 9,000 kids voting this year, which is a huge number for us. The program is so popular that thanks to Denise spreading the word, um, it is now done in Oregon, in um, New Hampshire, in Georgia, and Oklahoma. So that program is touching a lot of kids across the country. And we also do Connecticut History Day. And today, Nicholas is um, a History Day student who is on the commission with us. He's our youth participant, and we're really happy to have you. History Day basically teaches students how to do history. And once they can do history, they have better media literacy, they have better um, chances at civic involvement. So that is a statewide program for students in middle and high school. And I'll just name one fun thing that we just did for the first time a few weeks ago. Um, Connecticut used to have an election cake that was very, very popular. It was, uh, it probably tasted terrible. It was a spice cake with all kinds of horrible ingredients in it. Um, but we invited bakers, professional bakers, to make their own election day cakes with an election themed decoration. And we had about 108 people here, exactly 108 people here for the event a few weeks ago. Walt Woodward played with the Band of Steady Habits. He wrote an election cake song, and it was just so wonderful to see people happy to be talking about the elections. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an event that we want to grow, and in the early 19th century, there would be parades going down Main Street to the old state house, and women would compete in making tons of cake and feeding it to people, so we really want to grow it to that point and hope everybody can participate. So that's just a, a sample of the building and the things that we do here. Thank you, Sally, and that's exactly, I hope this is getting your creative juices going because that's, those are the kinds of things that we hope we can bring to the table for this event. So I, am, I agreed, when the governor asked me to chair this commission last year, I was still secretary of the state, uh, but I have a lifelong interest in uh, civics, civic engagement, um, and really tried from that perch as Secretary of the State to, to support programs like what Sally's talking about. I've worked extensively with Steve Armstrong at the Department of Education and so forth. So, uh, and I, I wanted to bring you today greetings from the governor. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but I think he will be at future meetings. He has a personal interest in history, particularly Connecticut history. So uh, I think he'll be following what we do with great interest. Um, and his representative may come later, Kathy um, D'Amato, who is in his executive office, will be working with us. So um, I could say a lot about what our um, goals are for this commission, what our mission is. We'll talk about that a little later, but first I want to introduce my vice chair and uh, say first that Jason Mancini also has had, I'm sure, a lifelong interest in Connecticut history in all its forms and is now the executive director of the Humanities Council who will be guiding this commission and doing a lot of the administrative work of the commission. So I'd like to have him say a word. Thanks, Denise. Yep. It's, uh, it's wonderful 
to be here with all of you. Um, I'm so excited uh, you've all agreed to participate. Um, we are at Connecticut Humanities thrilled to be uh, engaged in this process. This is something we've been thinking about for a long time. Um, in fact, we held a, an initial meeting to brainstorm around this in March of 2020 at <laughs> Connecticut Historical Society, just to gauge a level of interest um, from different parties around the state that we knew would be interested. Uh, and then a pandemic happened. Um, so we had to table that for a while, but very excited that um, to be able to partner with Denise uh, on this initiative. Um, my interest uh, does go back quite a bit, um, having worked with tribal communities and communities of color for a long time. I'm particularly interested in making sure that the commission has broad representation um, and we've achieved that. Um, we'll continue to expand through <coughs> subcommittee work and so on. Um, administratively, um, I might be getting into this. No, that's okay. Okay. Well, we should introduce everybody first, okay. right? We'll yeah. get into that. Yeah. Sure. Um, we'll get into that. <laughs> so it's great to be here, um, and I'm honored to, to be in this role. Um, so thank you. Okay. So um, we're just going to go around briefly so you all know who each other are and just introduce yourselves, say a few words about, you know, uh, some of you are representatives of various boards and commissions and and uh, agencies and others are public members. So let's let's start right over here. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Michael Kicking Bear Johnson with the Mashantucket Pequot Tribe. I'm currently the Acting Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and uh, my role uh, on this commission is uh, new to me, so uh, I'm looking forward to participating on the commission. Uh, my role uh, with the tribe right now is uh, basically looking at our advancements in historic preservation. I work very closely with Kathleen Levideo over here, and uh, it's great to be with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am Deborah Shonder. I'm a state librarian. Uh, in addition to many of other responsibilities, the state library includes the state archives, Office of the Public Records Administrator, and the Museum of Connecticut History. So when we're talking about a lot of these founding documents and, and the history of Connecticut, we have a lot of that uh, physically and electronically within our collection. So I am very uh, proud to be here uh, and representing the State Library. Great, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Liz Shapiro, and I am the Director of um, Arts, Preservation, and Museums for the State of Connecticut with the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, so I have, um, my responsibilities include um, running, making sure that the SHPO office runs. So very happy that you're here. And, um, and um, as which it seems to do very effectively. Um, and I also have four, four state museums, four historic properties, one of which is the Henry Whitfield House, which has a very interesting history um, because it was the oldest Western built structure in Guilford in 1639. Um, the, there's, the stones are original, and that's almost about it in the, <laughs> in the museum. Um, but we, yeah, but we um, have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we tell the story of the Henry Whitfield Museum, because that is the story of colonization, and is also the story of the colonial revival. Um, both you know, instances of violence against people who were here prior to us, so. That's my interest. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jonathan Slifka. I'm an executive assistant to the commissioner at the Department of Aging and Disability Services. Uh, in a previous role, I worked in the, in the Loy administration as the liaison to the disability community, uh, which was my first introduction to, to the secretary. Uh, we worked closely on a number of issues over the years, and uh, when the invitation came to be a part of this and, and bring the uh, bring the perspective of the aging, and in particular, in my case, the disability community, which is uh, quite often considered an afterthought when we think about history in, in, in so many ways. And so uh, to be able to bring that perspective is, uh, is a, a thrill, a pleasure, and an honor. That's what brings me here today. So thank you, Madam Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I will just say uh, Stephanie Thomas is the new Secretary of State. I did speak with her. She's very interested, but could not be here today because she just got elected. And so <laughs> she's got some other things to do. She will join us in the future. And uh, what's my use is um, on the. Into my use oh, yes. Yeah. That's right. So, can Maisa, would you like to say hi? Hi. Um, 
Uh, did you did you speak to me? I'm having some trouble. I was trying to get my camera back on, but I, I can't get it on, and so I wasn't hearing too well either. That's okay, Maisa. We're just doing a quick round of introductions. Okay. Well, I'm Maisa Tisdale, and I'm the president and CEO of the Mary and Eliza Freeman Center for History and Community. We own um, the Mary and Eliza Freeman houses, which were built in 1848, and they're the last surviving um, structures of one of the the nation's earliest settlements of free people of color um, founded by um, indigenous and African uh, American people. Um, we're really interested in being a part of this project because the history of um, the antebellum north is hasn't been really um, given a lot of attention where uh, black and brown communities are concerned. And this particular settlement played um, a role in the emergence of the civil rights movement in Connecticut as part of um, the colored convention movement. And we were so delighted to find that there were writings still from people from this community. And so we're really happy to be a part of this and to bring um, this unique historical perspective to this effort. Thank you, Maisa. Nice to have you with us, even virtually. Thanks. I might have to drop off to try to come back in with the camera. So. No problem. OK, All thanks. Right. And so saying, just on time, <laughs> Stephanie Thomas, our new Secretary of State. First of all, welcome and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I know how to make an entrance. <laughs> We're just introducing ourselves and saying hi. I'm Stephanie Thomas. Great to be here. I had the pleasure of voting on this bill last year uh, in <laughs> session, so I'm happy to see everyone convened around the table. I think this will be a wonderful way to bring Connecticut together around our history, so thank you. Great, thanks. All right, Sally, uh, we've already heard from Sally, so we'll move on, if you don't mind. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amherst Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. Um, so we're a membership organization serving museums, historical societies, and other memory institutions around the state. Um, we have you know, over 200 organizational members and a contact list of over 2,000 folks who are interested in history and Connecticut history in particular. Um, so uh, we work very closely with especially a lot of the very smaller, the small local history organizations, local historical societies, um, ethnic heritage organizations, um, and other mainly all volunteer run or sort of you know, maybe one paid staff person. Um, and I know that many of them are already very enthusiastic about the 250th. Um, and I was just fielding a question earlier this week by email from some folks in Norwich who have already organized a local commission and want to know what's happening at the state level. So um, I'm really looking forward to being able to help bring what is happening at the state level to the local level um, through our network of institutions and individuals around the state um, and helping communicate also what's happening at the local level back to the commission. Thank you for including me. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm Nicholas Angeli, I'm the uh, youth leader. I go to Rockville High School currently and I've been, I've just loved history my entire life and I'm a National History Day student. Uh, I've been competing for, I think this is gonna be like my fifth or sixth year competing. And I, over the summer, I spent a week in Hawaii studying World War II in the Pacific as a part of the 2022 uh, Sacrifice for Freedom World War II in the Pacific Student Teacher Institute. It's a long name. I always forget about that sometimes. <laughs> um, and there was 16 kids were selected worldwide to study World War II in the Pacific throughout the course of the year. And I was one of the lucky ones that was picked through the application process. And I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I thank you very much for it. Great. Thanks. Steve. Uh, Steve Armstrong, uh, representing the Connecticut State Department of Education. I'm the social studies consultant there. And um, I can just tell you that um, at the, in our social studies framework, soon to be standards, that Connecticut history is included for study in both elementary, middle school, and high school. So um, the fits are natural. Um, also, um, along with the Secretary of State's office and the Democracy Center at Old State House, we sponsor a program called the Red, White, and Blue Schools program, 
which honors schools that do uh, an exceptional job of civic education. And th this year's theme is which, and we're gonna, we can tweak the theme to match. That's the cool thing of running a program. You can make quick, you know, but our, our theme this year is um, studying our founding documents. Perfect. So um, thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Anthony Champalimo. Uh, this is a, a real pleasure. Um, thank you. Uh, I am here as a member of the public. Uh, I can also say that I'm a naturalized citizen of, of the United States, um, and so this is a quite a quite an interesting experience from my perspective. Um, uh, but I, I I live in Litchfield, Connecticut. Had the privilege of um, effectively growing up in in the Oliver Walcott House across the street from the first American Law School. I now live there permanently with my children. I'm in the hospitality business. I believe very much in the power of place and history. Uh, I happen to own a uh, very historic property um, just outside of Sharon, Connecticut. It used to be Connecticut at one time, uh, in Amenia, New York, called Troutbeck. Um, and it's at Troutbeck where we last year um, held something called the Troutbeck Symposium, which brought together actually some of Connecticut schools and some of our local schools in uh, Dutchess County, um, where 250 students uh, self-guided studied the history of, of Northwest Connecticut through the lens of Troutbeck's history, which is quite interesting, and then for three days presented their work. Uh, and so we're carrying forward that, 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 that program. I believe in animating place. Uh, I think that history uh, is a guide, um, gives us some integrity, uh, gives us uh, um, uh, principles to live by. Um, and I like having fun. Uh, I like having fun in historic places and animating them and giving them a sense of, of, of future and future purpose. Um, and we're fortunate that in Litchfield, uh, we have another project underway. It'll be the first, first hotel in uh, the center of Litchfield since 1855. Uh, I also like telling the story of architecture um, because particularly in this country, so much of it, and in New England, so much of the, the um, evolution of, of this part of the world is expressed in its architecture and in particular buildings. Um, and their evolution, and so we have this wonderful 1855 structure that was once a residence, and behind it is a beautiful, we'll make it beautiful, 1950s modernist structure. <laughs> um, and through, through, we'll finally, I think, be able to tell for, for Litchfield what is an extraordinary architectural history, um, you know, from colonial times into the present. So thank you. No. Thank you for being no. here. Pleasure. I can't see the next. Kathy D'Amato. Oh, Kathy D'Amato, who is from the governor's office, who we'll, we'll talk about her later, but she will be a very nice link for us to the executive offices. And she's very excited about this. By the way, she does other things like she arranges the inaugural ball every year. Kathy's been in the governor's office for many years, and she, she was so excited about this. I was afraid she was going to kind of shunt it off to someone else in the office, but oh no, she wants to do it herself, so that's wonderful news. So, okay, uh, and Steve Hernandez, I don't, I thought he was coming today, but anyway, Steve is a, a representative of the commission uh, that's now a joint commission on, I've, can you read it from here? I can't. <laughs> the law on children, seniors, equity, and opportunities. Yeah, I have to mention that I formerly was in the legislature for 17 years, and I can remember when we kind of joined all these commissions together, so I still don't really n understand how that all works. But Steve has been there all this time and will do a very able job of representing uh, those groups and connecting us with those groups, so. Hi everybody, I'm Andy Horowitz. I teach US history at the University of Connecticut, and I'm state historian. I'm new to that position, so uh, as exciting as this is on its own merits, I'm also excited to get to meet all of you and learn more about how I might support the good work that you do. Thanks. Very nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Rob. Good morning. I'm Rob Cret. I'm the director and CEO at the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, I moved here about three and a half years ago, so I still feel like I'm new, especially having to deal with COVID kind of in the middle of all that. I'm very interested in um, America 250 for a variety of reasons, and some have been touched on already, but I, I think that uh, America 250 creates an opportunity for us to really elevate culture, history, and the humanities. Um, and I'm very interested in the way that 
this commission could connect with tourism and to sort of uh, help everybody uh, in terms of uh, audience and um, at the various organizations and to help to coordinate so that we're not stepping on each other's toes as uh, we go through this. And I guess the last thing is that as a newcomer, I'm just really struck by the quality and depth of the cultural resources here in Connecticut uh, compared to other places that I've lived. And I just think that the community as a whole um, doesn't always appreciate what it has. And I think it's our job to help them to, um, to do so. Thanks, Rob. Very good point. <laughs> yes. Hi, Catherine Lavadia. I am with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. I did not grow up loving history. In fact, it was my least favorite subject. Um, so I, I will just put that on the table now. Uh, and I think it was because of the way I learned history. I was a first generation American. I couldn't relate to it. Um, I didn't like memorizing dates and I didn't like reading books. Um, but here I am today, and it's because I found that history doesn't always have to be that way, that it is, can be much more inclusive, so I appreciate the efforts that have been put into this commission. And I also, for me, uh, history is best realized when it's tangible. I need to touch it to understand it. So I am very much into the power of place. Um, and in my role at the State Historic Preservation Office, I am a staff archaeologist. I am the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, and I'm also a state trail coordinator for the Washington Rochambeau Trail. So I'm hoping to connect all those pieces here. I'd be fascinated to know how you went from not liking history to where you are today. That must be quite a story. Because <laughs> like I said, history wasn't taught the way history actually is. And right. so what I became interested in was, you know, archaeology and kind of ancient history and yeah. more of a history of what my parents had talked about, where they came from. And then when I started doing it, I realized that you find that first artifact and when I could touch it and connect to history in that way. It just sucked me in. Interesting. Great. That's a great story, actually. All right. Good yes. morning, everyone. My name is Douglas Lord. I'm the president of the Connecticut Library Association. Um, we are an organ the professional organization for <laughs> librarians in Connecticut. There's about 850 members. In Connecticut, there are about 900 libraries of various kinds, public, special, academic, school. And there are thousands of librarians who work in the state. Um, the presidency is a one-year appointment, um, so there, this chair may be filled with uh, a various amount of people. We're really thrilled to be here. Uh, we, libraries generally have very deep and very local um, levels of cultural resource, so it is uh, especially important that we be able to highlight these things and assist in this effort. We are very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, past and current Madam Secretaries, and um, Jason, thank you very much. <laughs> Merle. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Merle McGee, and I have the pleasure of serving as the newest President and CEO of Everyday Democracy. And um, I have to say, I feel like I found, I found my people. <laughs> Um, as I definitely appreciate and value the power of history and agree that um, the opportunity that we have to make history present um, and real in this moment is incredible. Uh, at Everyday Democracy, we uh, support communities in having conversations that um, support their ability to grapple with and create sustainable solutions um, that benefit the entire community. And so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Merle. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, a great group. I can tell, I think we have the right people at the table here. So we're gonna move on to the next section of the agenda, uh, reflecting on the mission, the origins of this, and we'll try to make this as brief as possible. We don't have to go into great uh, depth at this meeting yet, and there's plenty of reading ahead. There's, uh, you'll see at your place, Making History at 250, which explains a lot about what we're doing here. Uh, but I'll start just by talking about what is the mission of this commission. And I have to say, I am very resistant to writing mission statements. I've done it many times. It's agonizing. 
people, you know, get caught up in wordsmithing. So I took the um, the, the opportunity, I guess, to uh, write down what I think our mission should be. And it comes from, the, there's language um, in front of you also from the executive order of the governor, which lays it out pretty nicely and also shows you um, that the members of this commission were pretty much established in the executive order directly. Uh, as, as we said, many um, the agencies are here, organizations that are directly involved. And, um, and some members of the public, including me. I am now a member of the public of this commission. Um, but I, I, I'm sure you realize, and it was touched on by some of you, that there are many, many organizations, individuals, all kinds of people out there already knocking at our door. And my attitude is, let's let them all in. And so one of the things we're gonna ask you to do, actually, is to uh, give us names, names, whatever you can think of, people that should be involved and we will find a place for them at the table. So um, here's the mission I think we're on. We will develop and encourage an inclusive celebration, commemoration and observance of the 250th anniversary of the writing of the Declaration of Independence through civic, cultural and historical events and programming. We'll also collaborate, there is a US commission on the semi-quincentennial established by Congress, as well as the uh, state level commissions in many of the other states. They are hoping to have all 50 states uh, collaborate in the end and have a commission in each state. But so far, I don't know where, what we're up to, but something like 20 states have already established commissions. We are not the first at all, especially when you consider that we're one of the original 13 colonies, uh, but we hope to catch up soon. Uh, our focus will be on Connecticut's place in the story in this event. And, and it's, you'll find already it's really difficult to stay focused. There's so many directions you can go, so many eras that can be brought into this story. And obviously it didn't, it, it was a moment, but it was also a culmination of many, many things international. You know, the whole world was involved ultimately. So I think we have to try to stay focused on Connecticut's role as much as possible um, because we are one of the original 13 colonies and we played an important role in the revolutionary area uh, in all different ways, including in this very building. So I think it's a, it's a story that needs more telling and more telling perhaps in a new and different way. And I think that for me is the most important reason that I agreed to chair this commission is because I think it, we are also in a moment in this country where we need to revisit our history and we re really need to remember the ideals of the period. So I'm less interested, frankly, in battles and wars and events than I am in the ideals of the revolutionary period and how it still hopefully is carrying forward today and, and what that means uh, to everyone, not only in the state, but of course in the entire country and the world for that matter. So I think the work we're gonna do here has an extra special meaning today. Um, and I hope we can all hang on to that idea. So here's the specific charge in the executive order uh, which you have, but uh, members of the commission are specifically designated, first of all. We're going to meet period uh, periodically over the next four years to carry out the mission. So we have until 2026, and it's really good. We have a lot of time to plan, but it's not as much time as you might think. Uh, when you start hearing, there are obviously a lot of programs already in place, but there is not a uniting theme. And if I digress slightly here, as a longtime member of several levels of government in the state, I can tell you, we are true to our founding and I'm gonna bring up a book right now. And I hope actually we'll end up with things like reading lists for people. But this, bu this book really changed my mind about how I think about New England. And it's called American Nations. It's the history of the 11 rival regional cultures of North America. Now I am no historian and I have no idea if historians consider this a very important book. But for me, it explained why we have such disconnects in the historic community, in the towns. We have 169 little towns, all still having town meetings, a lot of them. And I think we have to factor that into how we think about our state. Um, and and both, both the good things about it and the bad things about it. But among other things, hopefully this commission will be able to bring some unity 
among the many different organizations working on many different levels, uh, and many of you are represented here today. Um, so we have four years to accomplish this. We're charged with promoting the documentation, identification, and preservation of cultural and history resources, including archives, buildings, landscapes, objects, and sites related to the period, which means we're really charged with, and I think this is important, enhancing tourism, economic development, historic education, and outdoor re recreation. That's right in the charge of this commission. And for years, we've been trying to enhance historic tourism because it is one of the primary focal points of the state. And we have, we've struggled with what's our identity? What is our identity as a state and a place? And maybe in some ways we can try to address that, but I do see coming out of this um, some tourism opportunities. And I think some of you touched on this. We are also charged to tell the story of the vital contributions of African American and indigenous people to the story of America. And I think that's terribly important right now in, our, in this time in our history. Uh, several of you have alluded to that as well. These are stories that have not been well told. And I think uh, Jason's gonna talk a little more about that in a minute, so. Um, and we're also asked to explore ways in which the ethos of the United States national founding period and the 250 years that follow influence the US present and can shape its future. And there's the period on the sentence. I think that last part is the most important because we don't just fo focus on the events of the period and the documents that were written, but that we honor the ideals of the Declaration, that all men are created equal, they have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think we're in a moment where a re-examination of these ideals will hopefully lead to a more profound sense of where this country has been and where it's going and how we move forward together. So um, I just want to make a couple of kind of technical points about your membership on this commission. We are now uh, all subject to the state ethics laws as members of this body. Uh, I have included a link uh, in your packet uh, in the agenda um, regarding what that means for you or could mean. And I would just say most of it is regarding uh, conflicts of interest. Most of it is probably not relevant to a lot of you, but there may be grants and opportunities, and I hope there will be, uh, that are you know, guided through this body. So just bear that in mind uh, when you're thinking about these things in the future and just be aware of these guidelines. Okay, that's it for me. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jason now um, because the Humanities Council and their staff, and thank you very much already for everything you've done putting this meeting together, uh, getting us organized, and he will talk a little bit about their role and uh, some of the things that they're planning. So, Jason. Thank you. Um, first, the, the composition um, and inclusivity of the commission. Um, I'd mentioned a little bit earlier, certainly through the executive order, many of you are part of state agencies. Um, that's really important um, that we find ourselves in an important time period of, of public-private partnership uh, with Connecticut Humanities and, and um, certainly the Office of the Arts, the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, but many of you are also um, partners. We partner in different ways. Um, we've, we've certainly um, found all of you uh, as organizations, uh, key organizations and partners, uh, to be collaborative um, and uh, capable of accomplishing the charge of the commission. So um, with all of that in mind, um, we have also made sure that organizations um, and communities are represented from across Connecticut. Um, we uh, made sure that the executive order contained um, a charge for inclusion of two tribal communities, uh, the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation and the Mohegan Tribe. Um, Michael is here representing Mashantucket. Um, we had hoped uh, in our earlier conversations that Chief uh, Lynn Malerba from the Mohegan Tribe would be participating along with us. Uh, her appointment as U.S. Treasurer uh, precludes her participation <laughs> in this commission at this point. Um, I don't know why she choose that over us. <laughs> so um, we are uh, hoping, I've been in conversation with her, uh, and hoping we will have a Mohegan representative uh, join the commission uh, as soon as possible. 
Um, we're thrilled that Maisa uh, and the Freeman Center uh, are represented. Um, our work uh, remains unfinished uh, in terms of other representation, uh, but through our partnerships, um, we, I believe, can accomplish some of this um, through organizations like the Immigrant History Initiative. Um, we also have a number of partners that will be intersecting, whether it's um, through the Connecticut Cultural Heritage Arts Program at uh, Connecticut Historical Society, the Connecticut Council for the Social Studies, uh, certainly the Connecticut League of History Organizations is an important partner. Um, uh, the Connecticut Democracy Center, all of Sally's work that she's, she's mentioned, um, uh, International Festival of Arts and Ideas will be important. Um, and Connecticut Explored Magazine is a new partner. Um, so we're hoping that through these different organizations and mediums uh, that we'll be able to uh, have full uh, and complete representation across our communities uh, in Connecticut and that everybody has a voice uh, on the commission. Um, one of the other areas I just want to mention, um, you know, Denise talked a little bit about not wanting to focus so much on battles, battlefields, and so on. And while they're an important part of this history, um, we will be celebrating the power of place, as Anthony uh, referenced. Um, and there are important places, whether they are the, the, the germ of ideas or ideals, uh, in the thinking of American democracy uh, and Connecticut's place, uh, or the particular battles that connect um, and, and, and people that connect us across the state of Connecticut. Um, but, you know, also thinking about uh, the continuity and, and the, the resonance of those into the present and into the future, uh, and the communities that are here now, the people that are here now, uh, and how we can. Uh, continue to uplift um, uh, the, the, the revolutionary ethos uh, and bring it into the future uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, and with that in mind, I just want to signal the, the importance of civic literacy um, and that we, we continue to sort of build our dialogues across difference. Um, this is something that I've learned in our partnership with the Dem Democracy and Dialogues Initiative at the University of Connecticut. Um, and our other sort of democracy-minded organizations like the Connecticut Democracy Center and Everyday Democracy, um, where we can uh, bring our communities together, every one of our communities, um, to really um, think about um, the best part of Connecticut's future um, and the investment in our communities and certainly in our young people. So I'm really thrilled that Nick is here. Um, and, and we'll hope that more uh, younger folks will continue to participate in this. Um, regarding the role of uh, Connecticut Humanities, um, I'm very excited that we are able to um, function in as, as the administrator, um, really sort of undertaking um, the implementation of the goals of the commission. I have an amazing staff, um, Amy, Amy over here, with communications, um, marketing, and engagement. Uh, we have Cindy, who's our uh, development officer. Scott Wands, our, our director of grants and programs. Greg Mengen, uh, who's our director of digital humanities. Adriana, who is our resident uh, manager of everything. Um, <laughs> and Mike uh, Knizis, who is our uh, manager of partnerships and projects. Um, all of them will have uh, an important role and function to support the goals uh, and initiatives of the commission. Um, so I hope and Sheldon. Everybody... Yes, of course, Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> He's my manager. Point. Um, so glad she's here. She's joining us from Honolulu, um, and she can accomplish everything and then some uh, from there. Um, we'll see her in person, hopefully in the spring. Um, uh, so. All that said, um, we, uh, we've been able to sort of uh, undertake uh, so much in the last uh, couple of years in thinking about this with our partners, our partner organizations, um, and bringing this to bear. Importantly, through um, our funded initiatives, uh, we hope through our, this is what we're, we're best known for, I think, um, Certainly the Connecticut Cultural Fund, which we implement in coordination with Liz and her team at the 
uh, Connecticut Office of the Arts. Um, so thinking about how to prioritize um, uh, grant making through the lens of America 250. Um, we'll be doing some um, private fundraising uh, as part of this initiative. Uh, Cindy will be taking the lead on that. Um, Amy will coordinate it, all of the communications, um, uh, I think in partnership uh, with the Narrative Project. Um, our digital work, uh, we're looking to one of our other partners is the Connecticut Digital Archives. So thinking about how we can really bring together all of our digital resources in an integrated way. Um, so Mike is uh, bringing that into a closer focus and alignment so that we can make our history and communities um, uh, more accessible um, to Connecticuts and beyond. Um, and I think I, I will leave it there. Um, there's lots to talk about on that in, in terms of the, the granular work, um, but um, we'll save that for later time. Um, I'd like to turn it, turn the conversation over to Scott Wands, um, who also sits on the board of the American Association of State and Local History, also known as AASLH. Um, and Scott is going to offer a bit of a national lens on where America 250 has been, um, what its goals are on a national level, and sort of helping the commissions see, zoom out a little bit and see uh, what's going on across the country. Scott. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Secretary Merrill. Um, and, and thanks, Sheldon, for helping with some slides here. Wanted to have some, some visuals for us all today. So, um, Sheldon, if you put on the, the next slide, thank you. Um, 2026, four years from now, the US will celebrate its 250th birthday. The semi-quincentennial is a once in a generation's opportunity to inspire and unify the public, engaging Americans from all 50 states, as well as friends from across the globe, to honor our historic progress and strive towards an ever more perfect union. Uh, next slide, please. Indeed, not since the bicentennial in 1976 are we likely to see as many Americans interested in rediscovering their country's roots, to understand how our democracy came to be, and wanting to visit the museums and landmarks associated with the birth of liberty. Uh, next slide. There are numerous important communities, individuals, and museums associated with Connecticut's ties to 1776, like Keeler Tavern in the Battle of Ridgefield, Governor Jonathan Trumbull's house in the War Office in Lebanon, Roger Sherman, Washington and Rochambeau planning the Battle of Yorktown in the Webb House in Wethersfield, and Samuel Huntington. Connecticut residents don't need to travel to Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, or Virginia to learn about the American Revolution. There is a rich history lying right in our own backyards, and now is our time to plan for how Connecticut will celebrate, contextualize, and interpret this anniversary. And there are many, many more stories that need to be told of the people, places, and events not pictured on this screen mm -hmm. and not discussed at the bicentennial that we all need to help bring to the fore for the 250th. Next slide. Connecticut has work to do. Much of the nation has already started its planning. Nearly six years ago, a full 10 years before America's 250th, Congress unanimously passed the United States Semi-Quincentennial Commission Act of 2016. Their charge was to prepare an overall program for commemorating the 250th for the entire country. Since that time, the commission, along with its administrative secretariat, the American Battlefield Trust has convened groups to review and learn from the celebrations of the Bicentennial in 1976, held a strategic planning retreat in Washington, D.C. in March of 2019, and created a report inspiring the American spirit, America 250, that was given to the president at the beginning of 2020. They've raised money for private donations, received a, f a federal appropriation of $500,000, and have been building an alliance of relationships. Next slide. AASLH, the American Association for State and Local History, and as Jason said, I'm uh, the incoming secretary for ASLH for the next two years and reappointed for the next two years after that, has worked with these groups and formed its own US 250th task force with partners from across the country. The past four years, ASLH has conducted surveys of the state-by-state -state planning efforts and published their findings. Uh, next slide. Thus far, 
as of August in 2022, 29 states have created official commissions with pending legislation in California as well. Uh, next slide. When I received ASLH's report, uh, I'm sorry, early on in its work, uh, ASLH's 250th task force identified five grand aspirations, five key areas for how the semi-quincentennial could positively affect public engagement with history. Those aspirations are, and, and I encourage us all to be thinking about them as we, we continue our work, emphasize history's relevance to every American every day, tell an inclusive story about the American past, increase funding for history, enhance the public's engagement with history collections, and highlight the importance of history education. AASLH hoped that these aspirations would inspire history practitioners to set ambitious goals in the lead up to 2026. And I encourage us to keep these in mind as we plan our efforts. Um, next slide, please. In 2021, AASLH created and published the field guide, which we all have copies of and which is linked online. Um, I actually was one of the um, contributing authors to this. Uh, the goal for this was to help all Americans, all history organizations find a role and a place in the 250th. Uh, next slide. You know, I think the big takeaway from here, and I'm not gonna read from it for you, I hope you all will, will read this as we continue on, is that we must make sure that Americans of all ages and backgrounds and in all places see themselves in history. That was important work that we were trying to do here. Whether you're from one of the original 13 colonies, whether you're from the 50th state in the union, whether you're from people who have had their stories told previously, whether you feel like your stories have not been told, whether you came to this country a week ago, we want you to find ways that this anniversary will help you find a way to better understand who we are, where we've come from, where we're going, where we've succeeded, where we've failed. And that's what I hope this booklet will help places all across the country including us here in Connecticut too. Uh, next slide. The themes that we put here were broad in ways that every organization will hopefully find a way or multiple ways that they can tell our story. Unfinished revolutions. What were we trying to accomplish in the 1770s? What did we accomplish? What have we not accomplished? Place. Using place as a way to tell the story. What was happening in your community, no matter where your community was in the 1770s? How has place driven our, our fight for freedom and civics and democracy over time? What events have happened in your own communities that connect to the national story? The people, who are we as a people? Who gets counted? Who has not been counted? Um, what are we doing to help people feel connected and franchised and what work do we still need to do on all those areas? The American experiment, you know, we like to think that we are, um, something that other countries around the world look to uh, as, the, as the cradle of democracy. What have we accomplished? What was good about our experiment? Where have we failed? And then in doing history, kind of turning the lens back on, especially in today's very polarized times, how can we help the public better understand what it means to do history, the work we do at museums and as historians, and um, how we do the work we do will be an important way of helping the public better understand um, what history is and how the story changes as we learn more and as time evolves. Um, so with that, I, I will leave it unless there's any, any questions, but um, look forward to working with you all with the American Association for State and Local History. Um, there's one more slide. Uh, the Pomeroy Foundation um, raised, uh, actually recently uh, gave $400,000 to the American Association for State and Local History. We are going to continue at ASLH to uh, do work to support organizations and commissions all across the country. Um, that money is going to have a full-time staff member at ASLH to create programs and resources and workshops and trainings, uh, many of which I, I will look forward to connecting with you all to bring to Connecticut. Um, and as we work towards that, that anniversary and moving beyond, because the story doesn't end um, on July 4th, it continues on well into the future. Thank you. Um, are there any questions on that particular set of resources? Are, are the slides online, or can we get can the commission get a copy of the slide presentation? We can get you the slides, yeah. yeah perfect. I believe the um, 
the, um, fa it's Facebook Live that we're on. I believe it is being recorded. Am I right about that? Yes, and, and I'm anyone? remiss in not asking all of you sooner if we could have permission <laughs> oh, to yeah. record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's open to the public, right? So. Does anybody object to being recorded? Too late now. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, Sheldon. I just saw your message. <laughs> Okay, um, so just, we've touched on parts of this, but on the agenda is what is Connecticut's place in the founding of America. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in, as a lifelong resident of Connecticut, uh, to maybe recenter uh, Connecticut's gravity um, in, the, in the story of the American Revolution. Um, and that's not just around the events, um, as we've talked about, that's around the origins of constitutional government um, representative government um, and ideas of independence um, and those can be rooted in um, the, uh, the fundamental orders of 1639 um, certainly the, the Charter Oak or the legend of the Charter Oak um, that go back a century or more um, prior to the signing of the declaration so I think there are lots of opportunities to be thinking about uh, what it is about Connecticut and the people of Connecticut um, that, that ground um, the ideals and ideas of uh, the revolutionary era and, and maybe just a little sidebar, perhaps it was premature to cast aside the still revolutionary uh, uh, logo of <laughs> yeah, although I never, I I never quite liked it, but, um, uh, but I think we should be thinking about ourselves as always revolutionary, um, especially for the future. Um, in the way that this state has, has revisited the issues of uh, the Constitution repeatedly over the centuries. Um, and, you know, grateful for the Secretary, former Secretary's uh, work in uh, continuing to encourage um, um, representation uh, through, through greater outreach, uh, encouragement of um, voting rights. Um, so I think that's our, our ongoing work um, uh, as part of the commission and as part of uh, uh, the state. Um, okay, so I think we turn it yes. to you. Back to me. So any, any questions for Jason so far? We're, we're giving you a, a big, a broad overview, I realize, but we wanted to help everyone understand what the structure of this commission will be roughly, you know, and then we'll get into more detail and more discussion after uh, a few more sessions here. So how do we get started? Uh, and that was a question I asked myself early on. Um, and I, I took the liberty of reading some of the plans that have been put forward by other states, figuring we could learn something. And one that particularly interested me was the issue of as I call it, taking it to the people. Um, I think we still have time to do some of the things other states have done, which is they had community conversations about the commission, about the 250th, uh, in many of their larger communities and sometimes smaller communities. I, I would like to uh, do something like that. I would like to invite communities to be very directly involved, perhaps have a uh, person in each town that wants to be represented, to, to spearhead whatever is gonna happen in local communities. Because I love the idea that, as I say, we, we have this structure in what they call Yankeedom in here, uh, basically New England, um, that is very small town oriented. I mean, and it will remain so probably in my lifetime. And so um, some ideas around how we engage communities directly, I think would be useful. And one thing they did this, I got this from New Jersey, they did this, and they had a little more time than we did, so I don't know, you know how we're gonna do this exactly, but, um, and they, they had forums in each town and invited people to come in and say, you know, what they thought we should do to celebrate the 250th. Uh, I think that would be a great way to start uh, by just kind of gathering information from people. Where are they right now? Uh, so that's one idea I had. There may be others. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in um, the local historic societies and libraries, for example, who are great uh, conduits for that sort of conversation. But don't count out the town halls and the town councils. And you know, so I would, um, I think what we're going to start 
doing is just sending out a missive to all the towns and say, this is what we're doing. Is there someone in your town that you'd like to designate as the point person on this project? Um, and that's, again, because I feel this should be bottom up rather than top down. Uh, that's the way it'll work the best. I also uh, am very interested in how that connects with this idea of how we bring together this, you know, we've alluded to it, several of us, this idea that Connecticut had a place in this conversation that really hasn't gelled, if you will. And we've been trying for years, I know. But this could be the moment that we can actually make it happen. I don't know if Liz or, um, or um, uh, Kathy, Kathy, yes, yes. sorry, um, want to weigh in on this idea because I think that is very specifically a way we can encourage all of Connecticut to be part of this is through tourism. And, um, you know, a lot of people come to our state because we have the little, the town greens and the little churches. And I mean, that's kind of the image of Connecticut, also sort of suburban. Um, and, you know, I remember the Humanities Council, I worked years ago with Bruce Frazier, rest his soul, um, who was a previous director of uh, Humanities Council. And we used to talk about how, you know, between New York and Boston, not a great, you know, <laughs> not a great image. I mean, it's not bad. <laughs> so we're still, we're still having that conversation today. And um, I don't know, I, I see there's a place here for tourism that I think should be prominent. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I've been charged with, and um, Kathy and I will both work on together, is to be working directly with the Office of Tourism, um, with Noelle Stevenson, who's the Director of Tourism, and staff that are working on planning what campaigns look like in Connecticut that can support, you know, um, cultural tourism. Basically, that's what we're talking about in 250th tourism specifically. I think right now the job is we've had an initial conversation where we said, you know, the 250th is coming up, and that's going to be like a tourist thing, and they were like, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was alive in 1976. I was in fourth grade. And that's what people did. Like, we, we went, we did that. 1976. 1976. What did I say? 1976. <laughs> <laughs> alive in 1976. <laughs> I was. Um, so 1976. So, yeah. So um, I think that there's going to be a little bit of education, but as soon as we have momentum from folks at this table, um, they're definitely willing to learn and to keep an open mind. I don't know that anybody there really remembers that time, so I think it's going to be new, and I think probably one of our jobs, and Scott, maybe this is something that um, you can help with too, is to connect um, Connecticut's tourism efforts with the 250th into the tourism efforts of other state via the national network. So I, I feel like there's a there there and um, people are willing, they're just like not quite sure how to do this and we will be point advisors for that. Great. Okay, uh, yes, Stephanie. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I love this idea of taking it to the towns. One thing I'm sensitive to is that even at the local level, people who often feel their stories are untold are often at, not at those tables either. Um, so just two ideas that just occurred to me would be trying to find a way at the local level to coordinate with ancillary groups. Two that came to mind are artists um, who often permeate you know, on the ground and also small businesses which often represent a very different demographic. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs, micro-businesses, um, thinking about the uh, economic development piece of this is something to keep in mind. Interesting. So can I add to that? Because, you know, just thinking about this, I see a great model coming out of the planning world, which is called the planning charrette which is very community-based. It goes about reaching out to different organizations, different people, very mindful of the ways people like to communicate, whether it be written, verbal, video, whatever. And I think that might be a great page. And I love the idea of doing a statewide conversation at a local level. So like designating July 1st, 2023 as the charrette statewide happening in every community and you know, really providing a guideline to each town of how you can do it and providing some kind of support. 
that's a great idea. I like that. So I would, I would add and build on that that libraries provide that critical yeah. um, overlap yeah. between community. There's no other. There's no place in in municipalities like the library. Yeah. They talk to everybody. Everybody. Every town has a library where librarians are thrilled to help to be involved. We have the rooms. We have the equipment. That's that's a definite yes. Jason, I don't know if you want to talk a little more. What, what we haven't talked about is the, the resources that we're putting in place at the moment. Things like, uh, uh, you know, are we going to have a website? Are we going to have, you know, how are we all going to talk to each other? And what's going in place where we can start bringing these ideas together? Or was that yeah. later in the agenda? It, Am I jumping a, ahead? It's a little bit later, but it's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we can certainly touch oh. on that. Oh, um, there we are. on the next page. Yeah. Um, you want to touch on it now? Um, yeah, kind of. Actually, I do. Uh, because I think, you know, as we generate these, th this thinking and ideas, I want to make sure people know where to send them. We're, we're obviously, somebody's taking notes here, not me, but, um, you know, it would be nice to, so that everybody understands this will be a two-way conversation and there will be a place to put these ideas on the website or, you know, whatever you're putting together. That? Might be getting ahead of my staff here, but I'm going to oh. put two people on the spot. Okay. If Amy can talk about the status of the website, and Mike, I think around the communications framework. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for the um, the way we've networked um, partners. Amy. Sure. Um, uh, we have put up a website um, just to kind of get things started, and it's uh, ct250.org. Um, so you can check it out. The meeting, the executive order is there. The commissioners are listed. Um, you'll see the press conference um, with Governor Lamont and uh, also the 250th um, AASLH book and resources are available there as are um, meeting agendas, meeting minutes, things. Um, and then that can take whatever form uh, the commission decides we need to make sure that we're sharing as much information as possible. Yes. Is, is that, that really on the humanities council at a wider level? Because I'm getting a lot of inquiries about like what's happening at the state level. It'd be great have to have a place to send people. Absolutely. Okay. It's live. Yep. We'll go out in the so newsletter. Go in there, <laughs> yes. And it's been shared with the folks uh, watching through Facebook as well. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. No, no, no. That was that was my question. Whether we we could have it's open to anyone and and people can sign up. I'm hoping we'll have some sort of, I don't know what to call it yet, but a listserv, for lack of a better word, of all the organizations and people who want to be involved. Because likewise, I have had probably 50 calls from various people saying, oh, Denise, I'm, I love history, I want to get involved. And so we're going to have to find a way to, to do all that. But right now, I just want to put them all on a list and start a, you know, maybe a, a newsletter or something so that people know there are things happening and that there's a place for them. So right now there is not the functionality for people to subscribe, um, but by Monday there will be. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, and then we can collect that and, and go from there. Yeah. Uh, John, you had a question? Yeah. Has the website, just from an accessibility standpoint, has the website been tested and, and there's certain accessibility standards that go along with it? with any website, and I'm just wondering if those guidelines have been followed or if it's been tested appropriately. Yeah, absolutely, and we can talk about that afterwards, sure. but the answer right now is probably not sufficiently. Okay. Um, it's, it's pretty much a placeholder, okay. um, so let's talk about that sure. so we can Thank share you. that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I, I was shaking my head because uh, on accessibility, actually, there are services that can do a very good job um, making sure that sites are completely compliant mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, in that regard. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and Mike, if you can just talk briefly about how we might network right. um, your portal. Uh, so one of the projects we've been working on is a way to get our partners to work together and do communication channels that are clear and evident, because right now, right, we can do a listserv, but what about those one-off comments you want? So we are investing in software to bring groups together. It's kind of a social networking, LinkedIn kind of hybrid. Um, so this group could use that software. If we want to go down that road, that could be a private group where we can share things, and then we can make certain parts public if we produce documents, and there's one place we can send people to. Um, we are working that out through kind of a scope project, but I'm more than happy to work with this commission to, to figure out if it works for us 
And if not, we have other methods too. Um, we're very flexible. We want to make sure it works for everybody so they have the information they want um, and you can contact who you want. <coughs> I'm not the techie in the crowd, but it sounds good to me. I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll test it out. I, I like to surround myself with people that know far more than I do. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, and Greg, if you could talk briefly about the resources we've aggregated around um, um, sites, people, yeah. and so on. So we just sort of really started out with sort of the, the data gathering stage at this moment. Um, just trying to wrap our heads around some of the material and resources and collaborative partners that are out there. Uh, so we started looking at um, really at sort of a timeline of stories that are unfolding both simultaneously in Connecticut and outside of Connecticut as a way to uh, give organizations a place to start thinking about programming, uh, sort of provide an entry point into discussion about a lot of the ideals smaller acts of resistance and other stories that sort of take any combination to find the final period. Um, also with the idea that uh, you know the revolution doesn't end on July 4th, 1776 and moving on beyond that. There's a lot to learn there. <coughs> Excuse me. Also looking at uh, local history stories as a way to potentially engage organizations throughout the state and recognizing some of the stories that happen in their own communities. Be working with uh, Amherst and CLHO like as a way of sort of putting this together to initiate conversations with these organizations uh, about this thing and initiative. Um, looking at collections throughout the state that things tap into um, that to sort of provide some tangible reinforcement to uh, a lot of the stories we want to tell, places we can send folks. Um, also started thinking about other ways to approach the topics, like through literature, um, literature from the period, literature about the period, fiction, nonfiction, children's lit poetry, just different ways that we can get people to uh, engage with the materials. Um, there's actually a link to these data sheets at the bottom of the agenda for anybody who has access to it online. You're all encouraged to uh, certainly to uh, Add to it. We will uh, look forward to. I don't know. It's not going to be in the final form. It's not going to be the data sheet. As you see, I'm sure it'll be something that probably lives on the website. Um, but uh, going forward, uh, we'll look forward to having something a little bit more robust and positive to present all of you as uh, the plan for the commission. Sharp focus. Sharp focus. Thank you. Steve, yeah. Um, yeah, could I just say, I always have my education hat on, so I apologize. But I think it's going to be, it would be important to know what teachers think would be effective and what, what certainly what students. We do a, um, a summer institute in June every year for teach social studies teachers. And I think a session on this with some ideas from them, if somebody would want to facilitate that on how teachers think we can best engage students. And we certainly don't want to just ask the teachers, but we want to find forums to get students to tell us how to engage students as well. Yeah. So I think that would be important. Going back to something that was mentioned earlier about, about discussion, public discussions, there's an inclination with celebrations such as this to, to hold conversations like that in historic buildings and historic sites within the state to highlight them for various reasons. Uh, while I don't want to discourage that, there are many within a colonial state such as Connecticut that even though great strides have been made, there's still large accessibility issues. Um, Secretary and I both worked in the Capitol and even a building like that has presented its, uh, its challenges. And so, Libraries, I think, are have been are a wonderful place to, to hold discussions such as those because mm -hmm. uh, at least every library I've been in the state has has been accessible with with everything, even as far as parking and, and, and so forth. So when we think about having planning discussions and, and large gatherings of any kind like that, just be mindful of that. We 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 would say, oh yeah, let's have it at you know this historic site. Maybe not necessarily the best place for it. Um, so again, just something to bring up and, and be mindful of as we plan plan things and events. That's a good point. Yep. Uh, sorry, if I may. 
Can you can you discuss a little bit sort of cadence and schedule? The idea of you know when we're engaging in conversations with local stakeholders and others and explaining. So yes, there's the anniversary is upon us. The question is, is there a is there a is it a is it is there sort of a are we percolating to a to a crescendo, or is it a, a period of time from January first until the end of the year, um, in which sort of we're targeting for program to be apparent to people? I, I think part of that is what we need to be talking about. Today. How do we want to prioritize? Um, I would like to ha ask Scott to maybe comment briefly on what this looks like from a grant making perspective, because he's really put a lot of thought into process. So some things need to be put in place now in order to take place in 2026. So Scott, just at least from part of this. Yeah, I mean, timing wise, what I really want to focus on, if we want people to start doing things in 2026, and we want them to do things different than they're going to be really doing on their own without some encouragement. We need them to start planning in 2024 and 2025. Otherwise, we're going to get a lot of things that look very similar to what we would have before. And if we want people to start planning in 2024 and 2025, coming for grants for us to be able to align to do implementation for 2026, <laughs> we need to be having resources and charrettes and ways of getting people to think outside the boxes to really start to, to get those plans going that will lead to the planning grants, that will lead to implementation grants. Um, we're not, you know, out of time already, but we're getting too close. We really need to start doing work in 2023, which is almost tomorrow. We really start to inspire plot to use those ASLH themes to really get people to think differently so they can come into us with grants in 2024 to plan for things. To implement them at 25, to do them at 26. So that's the timeline I've been talking about internally. Um, but this means that the commission needs to start thinking about ways that we want to get people to broaden their worldviews, to start thinking about ways that they could be partnering with organizations, reaching communities, doing things differently um, over the next year. And if I read somewhere, there's a deadline in January for us to submit. A, did I read that somewhere? That there was some form of deadline that we have to submit a actual plan. plan. Our yeah. Act, yeah, our actual plan by, I think it's January. Is that right or not? January 1st, 2023, an action plan to the governor and general assembly that outlines the goals, mission, recommendations, and an annual report each subsequent year, giving an update on the action plan. It's section eight. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was a little hesitant about throwing out the idea of community conversations because that, that would take some time. Um, and it probably wouldn't be in time for the report. But what, we, what I'm envisioning that we would have by the time we need to have a report is a timeline. And, a, and a, not, I wouldn't say a detailed plan of action, but some plan of action in terms of, you know, this is our first commission meeting. I hope what comes out of today is, you know, uh, some setting up of some subcommittees for example, a structure that we can talk about in this report, and then you know a timeline of activities, whether it's community conversations, uh, you know, raising a certain amount of money. Uh, there's there's a whole thing we have to do, probably going to the legislature for some planning funds uh, this session, and and that sort of thing. So it, it would be more of a structural report than an actual report of oh these are the programs we're going to run. Personally, I think this commission will not actually run programs as much as organize other people who are already doing things and kind of provide a structure for that set of activities that's going on in other venues. We might come up with some overarching, like, I don't know, big festival on July 4th, 2026, but, you know, I, I think it's kind of a limited job for us, frankly. I don't know, you have any more thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think a lot of This is my Issa. I don't know if anyone can see when I put my hand up, it's been up for a while. And just um, a quick comment that in terms of community meetings, we should consider using community colleges. They're both accessible and they already have a lot of people, um, you know, who go through and, and use their facilities all the time. They have a ready-made audience for conversations at a local level. 
Very good point, Aisa. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to offer one other comment to uh, Anthony um, regarding the timeline. Um, you know, I I've seen this as um, you know, the commission is shall terminate July thirtieth, twenty twenty eight. So it goes beyond July fourth. If if I had my um, druthers, it would really sort of move to 2033. Um, and I think, you know, we, we should be thinking about what this looks like um, beyond, um, whether it's an extension of the commission or we set something up in place that carries on, because there are going to be lots of anniversaries along the way. Um, July 4th, 2026 is, is a moment, but that moment sort of precipitates lots of other things. Um, so I want to keep that in mind. I don't want to overstep um, the, the governor's executive order. Um, but there are other things to consider, especially when I think about the role of tourism and how do we sort of think about keeping the, the energy and momentum going on some of this. Um, so. um, at the risk of deviating from your agenda, there are lots of thoughts and ideas going on. But um, I, I guess I wanted to talk about the Scott mentioned grants and grant making, and one of the things I'd like to encourage this group to do is to incent um, organizations doing things together. And I think America 250 could be a way for more cultural organizations to not do things on their own, uh, but to do things uh, together. Um, I think we should also be thinking about the role of art museums. And I think they've got historical collections, but they also do contemporary Art. And so I think there's some real opportunities with art museums that we should be thinking about. And I guess the last thing I'll just ask is where does branding America 250 or Connecticut 250 fit in with, is that part of the communications yeah. subcommittee? Um, I don't know who had their hand. Go ahead first. <laughs> um, just two things on the community outreach piece. Um, I, I would. I'm taking responsibility uh, for uh, an absence that I see thus far, and that's our state recognized tribes. Um, they really should be at this table, in my, in my view, at least one representative from each. Um, you know, so I would, I would ask that happen as well. Um, we appreciate, obviously, the outreach to our tribe and, and whatever that branch tribes, but um, it is a responsibility, I think, to make sure that they're represented. Um, I'll, I'll just offer, Mike, that yes, they, they will be, okay. um, and certainly participating in, in the subcommittee work. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, another form that, um, that Kathy and I sit on is uh, NAHAC, and um, I think that would be another form uh, that or perhaps we could address it there as well. Um, switching gears, marketing, um, is something I would always say is never too early to start planning. And I heard communications brought up, I heard branding brought up. Um, that. That's a piece of that, I think. Um, also, that outreach piece, if it's for museums, art museums, for example, each entity has their usually their own marketing divisions. It would be interesting to find out you know, what they might be putting towards this, if they're even aware of this, and assisting in that sense, um, you know, those, those types of efforts. So just thought I'd throw that on the table. Yeah. Thank you. So, I was king off of what Anthony had said, is July 4, 2026 is going to be the crescendo, but there are a lot of dates that lead up to that and after. And, and to Rob's original point about making sure we're not stepping on each other's toes, how do we work together? But then how do we also plan this, particularly when we're working with the community, some of their events and the thing that was significant in their community may not have been July 4. It may have been something leading up to it. And as we're thinking about scheduling, I would hate to see everybody having an event on July 4 and everybody competing with each other. So how do we encourage them to think about that timeline throughout before and after the event so that we may, we have that big celebration, but it's in concert with a lot of smaller ones before and after too. So I was appreciating that just tying together some of those points that have been made too. So is this the official branding, by the way? That is what's been provided by the national um, organization. Okay. We're not obligated to keep that. That's okay. what's landed on our desk. <laughs> Jason, it's a little dark. Jason, if, if I um, share just quickly, there's a Dropbox link on the agenda. So for when folks go 
to your laptops and have a chance. Um, that national um, source of resources is they can see um, what else they provided and at meetings, future meetings, you can come together as the commission to decide, you know, what we like this logo better. Um, but that, that resource link is there for you all to take a peek at. Is there a toolbox there of guidance? A toolbox of what, what, what is um, that? I'm sorry. To, to help people, you know, promote and things like that. Are yeah. multiple documents in there? Oh, sorry, Jason, go ahead. I think it's been more intellectual guidance resources right now than branding and marketing resources. Okay. I don't know if that will come, but I don't know those yet. Thank you. Let, me, let me just say, I think that will be the work of one of these subcommittees who could come back and report immediately. Honestly, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on getting new logos. I've been there too. It's like mission statements. It can go on forever. <laughs> um, anyway, I think there is value in wedding ourselves to the National Commission in this regard, and there are other versions of this. Uh, but they have kindly, I think, done the work for us. If we really just can't live with whatever they have done, I'm open to the idea that we rebrand, but I'm not enthusiastic. Let me just put it that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. um, so a couple of uh, a couple of thoughts um, that I had and some curiosities. One um, is around just what is meant by inclusion and what are, are we willing to consider um, spending some time around developing a core, sense, a core set of principles in, in order to guide whatever the work is um, that comes after. Um, just as I'm hearing about accessibility and, and, and those sorts of things. Translation came up in my mind yeah. um, and, and such. So that, that's one question that I have. And then the other curiosity that I have around um, the narrative of untold stories and people who are not um, or have not traditionally been a part of the conversation. I, I think that is important and I think that's great and I think that is um, necessary, but perhaps maybe not sufficient. Particularly as we are looking to continue to grapple with the question or the common phrase perfecting, right, a more perfect union. Um, I believe, I'm assuming, we have a lot of history people here, um, that the opportunity of learning from history um, also um, presents an opportunity to reckon with that history. And how do you reckon with that history and make commitments moving forward, right, around this perfecting? Um, and what does that look like? And so telling the stories are important, right, and necessary. But if we are to actually become what we seek to be, what is it that we need to reckon with as a part of that process and on the journey? I think stories being told are important, but I wanna understand what did you learn from that? And how will you be different? How will you move differently as a result? And I think that, I think some truth telling is, is always a part of that as well, so. That's a thought I had. That's a very important and timely question, and one I do hope we would address. I'm assuming we would address it to some extent through the grant process, that, that this would be part of what we look at in terms of uh, how that grant works. You know, you can write that into the grant as one of the considerations for whether that would be granted. Um, that's one thought I had. Uh, and there are others. I'm sure we are, th that is a core mission from my point of view of this commission is to not just, as you say, tell the story, but find out what we learned from those stories. I'm saying that as I chaired a commission on the 100th anniversary of the uh, 19th Amendment a couple of years ago, which was in 2020, and a very similar kind of mission. And I am 
excited about what has grown out of that, including, I think today, they're uh, doing uh, celebrating a marker of women who participated in the revolution that was the women's movement that gave us the vote, uh, whose stories had not been told and have made a real difference in the way we think about all this. So I'm hoping this will be the same story here, but I'm open to suggestion of any kind in how we can make that happen. Uh, maybe we have a subcommittee that just looks at that and lays out, as you say, the ideals that we are talking about, the, the, those principles or whatever you want to call it, to define that inclusivity that, uh, and that action step that we're going to take to make that happen. What do you think? You like it? I like okay. it. Hi. This is, hi, this is Maisa again. I'm, I'm thinking that we can look at this celebration as an opportunity um, to leave a legacy of inclusion um, beyond the time that this uh, celebration takes place. So, for example, um, when we're looking at at museums or looking at libraries, can we um, can we strengthen their archives with information um, or presentations or online exhibits that didn't exist before um, on you know to uh, on people of color, for example. Um, or or tribes. Um, also, um, I don't know if things have changed post pandemic, but I know that um, Housatonic Community College here in Bridgeport didn't have any courses on um, African American studies at all. Um, they had something maybe like a club that was taught by someone, but no actual courses. So I think that as we put together activities um, or guidebooks or um, web um, resources, if we could also, you know, leave our, our public um, schools, public libraries, um, a, a legacy of this and, and better off than they were before, that that would be a great thing. So the resources kind of do double duty. Um, I'll just say, um, you know, certainly from the grant making side of things and organizationally with Connecticut Humanities, um, we have uh, an inclusion, diversity, equity, and access commitment. Um, and I think in looking at the subcommittees here, that might be an added subcommittee um, that the commission might want to consider um, to ensure exactly Merle's point and Maisa's point um, to make sure that. This is really codified in our core principles um, and that we carry this work into the future through everything that we do. Well, just quickly, one thing I'll note, that when guidelines come out from national organizations, they're guidelines that are created by people from every state in the union. And so those guidelines have to be acceptable to every political situation um, in every state. So I think it's up to us to take on the guidelines that A ASLH and others have created for the 250th and make them resonant in Connecticut to Connecticut values. And um, so I just want to just want to point that out. So think something that I always grapple with is when there are state when there are guidelines for the nation, they're going to look a little bit squishy because different political climates can only handle certain things, but we can, we can use them to make Connecticut. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Um, I really appreciate Merle, what you said, and it makes me think, you're going back to the nitty gritty of how we might organize the grant making. Um, we might, it seems like we want to not uh, try to tell, write a biography of uh, the United States or sort of fixate on 1776, but rather invite introspection, reflection, and reckoning with those things. And so, we might be, when you frame the invitation for programs and, and grant applications, to make sure we're not asking for what have you got on seven in the 1770s, but maybe like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and invite reflections on those themes, um, to pick a phrase from the Declaration, which is clearly brings us into the 17th, into the 18th century, but um, allows, it is elastic enough to say, well, what does, you know, what does liberty mean to you? Um, is a very different kind of question, I think, than what does 1776 mean to you? Um, anyway, that might be a way to try to. The tribes. What's that? Particularly the tribes. Well, exactly. I mean, so it, it, it says that it doesn't announce 
that we are here to celebrate the liberty that was created in 1776, and instead says, reflecting on that document, um, reminds us that, you know, uh, the pursuit of liberty is, a, is an unrealized project in the United States, and this is an, a, yet another occasion for us to think about it. And then, you know, so that's one way. And then the other thing, way more prosaically, maybe the grant application invites people to contribute to a comprehensive calendar for the state or something like that, so that as we ask people to frame their projects, it's like very much with a co coherence in mind, so we're, you know, not all stepping on each other's toes. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that goes back to my original point that what we're celebrating here are perhaps the ideals of the American Revolution, not necessarily just the event. And I think if we keep that in mind, it helps. And that's what you're articulating. So that sounds like the first paragraph of our report that's due to the government. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say one more thing, um, especially going back to Merle's point and also some comments that, which I take to be, how do we translate this into ongoing action in our communities? Um, and I think that the um, comment that was made earlier about um, I think it was Rob, you were talking about this incentivizing um, collaboration and organizational partnerships. I think thinking about that really broadly could be one way to do this. Is there a way that we can identify organizations across the state that are enacting these values, doing grassroots roots work in communities. Um, so if someone's having an event where we're having a conversation on, you know, like the meanings of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or what does liberty mean to you, connecting that with what's an organization in the community that's doing this work right now, I think that does two things. It invites that reflection, but also connects it to the present in meaningful ways. Um, and, you know, so if, if, I don't know if we can like come up with, I think quite, even quite apart from any grant making thing, like encouraging those sorts of collaborations and if we can come up with, you know, ways to identify organizations that are doing that kind of grassroots work locally, not just the history folks, um, but the people who are doing the civic work um, in, in whatever sphere that might be. Um, that that could be a really good service that this commission could provide is kind of like some matchmaking to help forge those partnerships that aren't, all, those people may not know about each other yet because they move in different circles, but they could do something really important um, with a lingering effect if they worked together at this moment. And then that could invite the public to become more engaged with those activities in their locality. Like how is this relevant to me in my community? Oh, these, you know, this organization is doing this work. I could get involved in that. I don't know. I'm just curious if we could build on that idea around actually um, <coughs> leaning into a set of metrics that we hold ourselves accountable to how we are reaching beyond where we may regularly um, go, right? And so how are we, how then are we accountable for the inclusion that we are seeking um, to, to accomplish and, and what is the quality of that inclusion um, and very specifically um, measuring that I think would be important and, and an important accountability tool for us. Very good point. I, I, I think everything is being said. What's going through my mind is the, I've been for 30 years now and beyond actually, um, I've been working mostly with school projects with people like Steve Armstrong to try to get people involved in some of these programs. And I, everyone at this table, I can imagine, struggles with that question. Because year after year, we'd, we'd have the same folks, the same schools, the same teachers involved, a very small portion of the overall picture. Same with community kinds of things we've tried to do. And I would point here to everyday democracy as one of the few groups I know that actually gets very local people involved in mostly mid-sized cities in particular, places like Meriden or Waterbury or, you know, and where you actually do reach people that don't ordinarily come into history museums or art museums. And so that's my question is how we reach those. I guess it is through organizations that are already trying to do that. Um, One idea, I'm sure there are others around yeah, this Yeah, I mean, it's different yeah. in every, you know, we have small towns, we have mid-sized cities, and we have large cities. And it's different in every one of those groups of 
kinds of communities. So uh, I think that is a good question. And I, I think it is important that we hold ourselves accountable because I know how hard that is. Uh, you, you always get the same people, the same schools, the same groups, you know, they have their, their um, community that's almost their little community in various towns and you don't reach the larger population and that is the challenge. So I think I'm getting a little overwhelmed with thinking about structure here, <laughs> um, you know. And so that's what I think we have to kind of grapple with next here. And that's kind of next on the agenda because we wanted to discuss how we're going to do this work. How are we gonna structure this in a way that we can all make these connections? Cause that's what we're all talking about. Um, so I don't know, let's, let's we, uh, Jason and I sat down and, and brainstormed what could be potential subsidies and how we could allow each of you to decide which one you fit in. Maybe there are others. I think one just emerged here that we we're discussing. Um, and some of them may be duplicative or whatever, but this is, uh, I'll ask Jason to help me discuss this right now. We, I mean, we've been talking about the first one, which is basically community level outreach. And again, uh, time is of the essence here. We've been a little slow, frankly, in getting this commission going. Um, Legislative process is never easy, uh, but <laughs> anyway, it took us about a year from the thought process to actually getting this commission uh, commissioned. So, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time for this. I would love to do the community outreach that I discussed in some structural way. Um, in my head, it was uh, having some sort of committee, if you will, at every, in every town that we can muster and doing some outreach to try to make that happen at the, uh, you know, maybe even at the regional council level, there are these regional councils of government where the mayors all come together and maybe I could go make presentations or Jason could go make presentations. Somehow get the word out to all the communities that this is something you ought to get involved in. And then at the local level, they could decide who would be on that uh, committee in each community. And then, they, they, then we would have perhaps forums for, for any town that wanted to have them, we could start organizing that sort of thing. That takes time. And so I can't imagine we have more than, let's say, six months to do that kind of a thing, but I'm open to suggestion. Um, so that's, that's the, the first one is about municipal outreach, you know, who we talk to, who does that. Maybe members of the commission would be willing to go out and make presentations to some of these groups, uh, uh, whatever. So that's, uh, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Uh, just quickly, for those of you who don't uh, read uh, or, or interpret acronyms um, that you've oh. never seen before. CLHO is the Connecticut League of History <laughs> Organizations. <laughs> uh, the DRSOs are the designated regional service organizations right. that Liz coordinates um, through the Office of the Arts. There are nine of them? Eight. Well, eight. Um, and, uh, God, I can't. CCM, Council of Municipal <laughs> Governments. Right, okay. And then, of That's course, the Doug mentioned the Connecticut Library, Library. Uh, Association, which I think will be an important conduit for these conversations. Um, can I just say, I think you might have two different groups there, and I don't know if it makes sense to have these different subcommittees, because I think working within the COGS and the governmental operations is very different than working with the community-based historic or cultural organizations. And so I just think the communication lines are so different that I don't know if there'd be a benefit to separating those. I'll leave that to the committee. Yep, okay. <laughs> The second one is obvious, um, you know, education, involvement of young people, which I think uh, is a question mark as to how we make that happen. Um, and Steve, you know, I'm hoping you will head up the subcommittee and give us some advice, obviously, yeah. you know, including some of our work in the standards or the, or the frameworks that are being developed, but also just how do we outreach to young people? That's, it's a real, question. I, I, I know, you know, there's different ways to do it, but yeah, Rob. Um, could this expand beyond K-12 and include yeah. uh, oh, college yes. university? Yes, it should, mm -hmm. yes. Or even beyond, the, I mean, mm -hmm. we're all learning, right? I mean, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if this is like, if you're really meaning just like the schools, 
like broadly conceived under education or if you're thinking about public education more broadly because you were talking earlier about about you know sort of civic education which i think is something that is an ongoing learning process for all of us just something to keep in mind <laughs> yeah we all do there's components of lifelong learning yeah. and you know all right. of that in everything that we all do so yeah. So I think of education here as an institutional education, yeah. and that's what I was thinking of more when I was saying about that other subcommittee breaking down, because I see that very community-based public component being different from the government municipal, and I was thinking that public's education being there. Okay. Yes, it's a question. <laughs> Thank it's you. even difficult to know how to include higher education institutions because Connecticut is so full of private and public institutions um, but yeah that's so that's what I'm struggling with I don't know exactly how to put a network like that together I mean maybe there are existing I'm sure there are existing youth networks I think oh names got out of my head there's one that's uh, focused on community community work oh, what's the name of it is the outgrowth of um, I don't know. I'll, it'll come to me. But anyway, there are there are some higher education, uh, almost like clubs that exist that go uh, across private and public institutions. So we'll we'll have to figure that one out. So that's a job for this education committee, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> figure out how to make that happen. And and that's a tough one, honestly, because um, students tend to move on. All the time. And, and I think it might be a mistake to have education stop at like it, our, we should go beyond, I think, like grade 12. Yes. That it should be a broader, uh, and I would agree that there should be a broader conception of the word of education here. I was thinking about Kathy's story, like people who come to history later in life and how can we engage them in this too? I think I see that under education too. Well, let's leave that to the subcommittee to figure out. <laughs> And Nicholas already has all the answers on how to get students involved. He just hasn't told them to me yet, but that's <laughs> What do you think, Nick? <laughs> um, well, I'm going to start off. I think the, most kids my age all have social media. We're all on social media and things like that. So if we can somehow put together maybe an official Instagram page or a Facebook page or something like that and push it out, um, maybe have some like high, like people with high names to reference us in a story or something like that just to get people that are my age to be able to see it and maybe follow us and things like that. I think that's probably the first course I actually take because we can do it whenever. It only takes 30 minutes to set up an Instagram account and things like that. Uh, and then other than that, like I'm gonna start talking to people in my school that I'm close with, maybe even some people that I have a lot of differences with, just because I don't really know how they get their information as much to kind of get a broad perspective on how people my age are receiving this information. And from there, I think we can pinpoint areas where we want to target and things like that to just push out as much of what we want as quickly as possible. Great, yeah, see, why didn't I think of that? Do we need to be yeah, delving yeah. into TikTok and Snapchat and all that? I, I wouldn't do TikTok and stuff like that. Then again, I don't really know how any of those things work. I would just stick with Instagram and Facebook. I feel like it's the more, uh, most official and professional way to do it. So, Can I say, add something to that? Um, there is an uh, initiative. It's a collaboration. It's kind of based out of the Smithsonian, but it's history made by us. Um, and they have been doing, they've been working with market researchers and working to kind of like Thought, think about Gen Z and how they like to receive information about history in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, so th they have many organizational partners, I think, here in Connecticut. We're one of them. So I'm on their mailing list, but they may be a resource as we're looking to develop because they have all of these reports that they've made through this market, you know, the, essentially what is like market research and communications research about effective ways of um, communicating historical content and engaging. Um, interested young people um, in history. So uh, while I would certainly not call myself an expert, you know, you want to look to folks like Nicholas here. Um, that's another resource that we could have um, if we're looking to build that out. And there are existing organizations on Instagram, you know, people who are already doing it. Yeah. There's, there's one, there's local to us, are the, the history chicks. It's arts of Northwest Connecticut, and they travel around and take the houses. It's the most remarkable thing. And they're on Instagram, and they have you know five thousand followers or something like that. Learn something every new every day. Yeah. yeah. And, and I Jason would. Jason and Denise. 
just a friendly ch um, check into the group that it's 1157 and I just want folks to be mindful of the time for your own schedules, but please continue as, as necessary. Thank you, Sheldon. Great reminder. <laughs> we could we could talk forever here, but anyway, go and ahead. Real yeah, quickly, Steve. I think there's a, there's some of the larger districts in the state who aren't involved ever in some of those in some of the civic initiatives we have. I think I'll make the commitment, and I think our group should make it to really work really really hard to get them involved in this. Yes, that's a always a perennial issue. I know. That's great. All right, I hear a little committee forming already. <laughs> um, then we had one we called events and programs. Um, and I guess that's obvious that we would come up with, maybe if this commission were to actually do some very specific programs, you know, we could grapple with that. And also that under there would come some sort of calendar of events, you know, how do we do that? Who do we reach out to? Um, what does that look like? That kind of thing. So, um, I think the only thing I would add to that is the next hire I look to make at Connecticut Humanities will be a coordinator position. Um, oh, yes. We'll really sort of aggregate and, and be that connective tissue. For the for two fiftieth. Yeah. Okay. Good. I was going to ask yes. about whether there was going to be funds for a staff person because I think Delaware. I just saw a listing. Delaware is the state of Delaware is just hiring somebody to do this work. And I thought that was a good model. We're, we're, we're Great. In that Thumbs direction. up. I've spoken with Rhode Island, and yes, there there are other coordinators forming. So I want to make Good. sure that our work. Oh, I would just say for current events and programs, I would encourage the commission not just to think publicly, but in terms of professional development that we want other organizations to be doing and how that makes it easier. Because then the commission doesn't need to be doing as much as they're inspiring others to be doing. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I think we'll just continue on here. Development, that's obvious. We're going to need to do some fundraising, uh, both private and public, uh, to make this all happen. Right now, we do not have a budget. We don't uh, have a specific budget where the Humanities Council is kind of uh, funding it as we go, shall we say, uh, within their existing resources. But um, we will need some people on this committee to help us uh, raise funds privately. So I will take that on as part of my mission, um, but I will need some help. So, and I guess that part's obvious, so. And Cindy will be in touch with all of you to think about names of right. people and organizations that might be contributors to this work. Uh, communications, um, you know, we've heard from Amy and Mike, and I don't know if you wanna say any more about what that committee would look like. I'm not sure it's a subcommittee, but. Um, I, that might go along with the coordination, the coordinator events yeah. programs piece. Um, I just want to make sure that we're tagging it because there's going to be a lot of uh, flow that we need to be thinking about. That might be more our role than a subcommittee for the commission, um, but we can, we can approach that with more specificity. Yeah, there. right. And then um, we thought about a youth council. Um, I think that would be great, and that would dovetails with what we were discussing before, and that would be a, a natural for Nick. Um, and you know, just it could even just be Instagram pages. I mean, whatever that subcommittee would recommend in terms of uh, contacting youth. But I thought about actually forming a youth council around the whole commission uh, would be great, and we could have it be geographically representative and so forth. So that's what our thought was there. And then finally, governance. We, we will have to have bylaws and that sort of thing. So anybody that's willing to help Jason and I uh, move this along uh, would be welcome. If you're the type that likes to be in charge of things, um, please join us. <laughs> uh, and then the add-on add yes. um, suggestion from the, uh, Merle yes. uh, reflected on inclusion, diversity, equity, access. Yes. We've covered the resources. Um, we listed a couple of affinity groups uh, that we know. You know, Kathy brought to our attention Washington Rochambeau. We're well aware um, both the sons and daughters of the American Revolution and Colonial Games are going to have an interest in this. Um, I know there will be plenty of other groups. Um, 
and that will be uh, listed in the resources. Um, so I just want to signal um, that. Um, it's nice. Again, I just wanted to add that there are also African American affinity groups like Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage and a couple more who I think would be interested in OGS, the African American, uh, Afro American History and Genealogical Society. They have, they, they just have a wealth of knowledge and people who are extremely interested in these topics across the country. Thank you. And that's precisely what we're interested in hearing from everyone here today is get those lists to us, get those names of organizations and so forth all to us. And I would, uh, Jason, how should we do that? That's one of our asks today, actually, is to really have you think broadly about who we should involve. And, and then we'll go from there. We'll get that out to subcommittees as they form to figure out where their place is in this picture. On the link that Greg mentioned earlier on the, on the agenda, um, we have those resources. You can just feed into that. Um, any suggestions you have of, of organizations or folks that we should be thinking about. And it could be individuals. I, I know several individuals have contacted me. Um, you know, they could be people we would put on a local planning committee or something. Um, so that's, you know, think very broadly about it. People that have mentioned to you that they're interested in this. I know uh, the son of one of my friends is very involved in Civil War reenactments. He's really into it. And, you know, I can picture him on the youth council. He's very excited about all this and just that specific thing. But I don't know how he ever got involved in it, but he's uh, like one of the prime people that goes out and does these reenact. I'm sure that all those folks are going to want to be involved. And it's great. It's a natural. Um, OK. Unless we have any more questions, I will. Um, so I guess the two asks we have of you today, just for now, are get us those names, get us that broad outreach uh, into our system as it develops. It will be developing quickly now, I think. And, um, and the second thing is to identify what subcommittee you feel you would like to work on. And we'll start setting those up um, because I think they need to meet fairly soon. Um, and um, so that that's for today probably what we'll be doing. We will write up the minutes of the commission and we'll start to think about this report that's due and structures and things we wanna put in the report and put it in place because uh, we will report back on our progress as of the first of the year to the governor and the legislature. And, um, and then, then we'll really start in earnest uh, to be moving on these questions. So the first thing we have to do is figure out when's our next meeting. Um, we want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, we have to meet, uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe even just quarterly, but maybe we meet a little more at the beginning. Now, I, my first question is, is whether people want to do Zooms or in person. I mean, I love the in person, but not everybody's going to be able to make it all the time. And I'd rather have it be both than having a lot of empty seats if we do it in person. So does that sound like a good idea to everyone? And, and they won't be that frequent, so I hope as many people can come in person as possible. But now that we've all met each other, it's a little more collegial, so uh, we're good. Do you, you have anything to add to that? Anybody? What, do you, what are we thinking in terms of next meeting? Uh, you know. December gets crazy. We'll probably um, communicate mostly through email. I'm assuming we have everybody's contact information and so forth. We might do a Zoom call in between, you know, just to kind of lay out committee work and have committees report back on what they're doing. Um, I don't feel strongly about doing it before the end of the year, but maybe we give ourselves a, but we have to come up with this report also. So um, I would say that Perhaps by the end of the year, our target would be we would have a coordinator in place who's going to take a lot of the pressure off Jason and his team to be doing this. This is all extra work for them. Um, and also have some sort of draft of a report that we would start working on as a group or could present to you, at least in some sort of outline form uh, by the end of the year. 
Is that doable? <laughs> is this hire happening? <laughs> my, my whole staff is panicking right now. I know. Because you know, we have about 750 grants to push through I know. by Christmas. Um, 800. Why don't we just assume that this report is going to have a 30 day uh, window beyond January 1st? Because I know how things work at the Capitol, and there will be, you know, everyone's just getting in place. Everybody gets sworn in, but January 5th, not before that. No committees meet. I still don't know um, from the DECD's point of view if we're going to go for you know, money in the budget, whether it's a, a bill of some sort. I'm hoping not, <laughs> because that gets complicated. But um, so I, I guess I'd suggest maybe mid-January as a mid target, an informal target. Yeah, Steve. Is there a thought that the subcommittees should at least have an initial meeting before then? Absolutely, yeah, Okay. good point. So hopefully we can get the subcommittees organized by early December and they would have a first meeting in December. That would be great. And then you could have a report back from the subcommittees by mid-January, let's say. Is that doable for everybody? So in terms of process, maybe having an understanding from commissioners what subcommittee or subcommittees you'd like to participate in. Right. Once we have that, we can sort of figure out who might chair uh, the subcommittee and then start to build from there, identify prospective other folks uh, that might participate outside of the commission. If, if it's possible in the minutes to, yeah, we've, we've defined some of these committees, I think, or at least clarified a little what their function is, if that could be included in the minutes as well as we consider. More clarity on the what if they you, are, uh, their yeah, role yeah, and I function. So. Yes, please. Yeah. Is there tourism? Like, I know tourism has come up a lot, but I don't see tourism as kind of like a subcommittee. Are we just thinking about trying to not balkanize that and embed it in all everyone's work, or do we want a group specifically working on the tourism angle? That would make it easy from my perspective here <laughs> to know which committee to join. So add to our I, I can I would. Yeah. 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 That's why we didn't define them too closely because we wanted to have a discussion about what they should be first. So Jason, for what it's worth, I'm um, the governor's appointee to the Council on Tourism as the Heritage Tourism representative. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, Rob. Thanks yeah. for volunteering. Here is the tourism committee. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Yeah, wonderful. Is there a master contact list? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sheldon can share that. Okay. And who, to whom should we co be communicating our right, that's pe yeah. contact people and the committee we would like to join? Like, should we send it to I think for now, Sheldon. Okay. <laughs> does, everyone, does everyone have her? Sheldon's like, what? Yeah. Everyone should have my contact, but I, but I do have everyone's. And um, please send me whatever you have, and I can drop it into the resource link um, spreadsheet. And Jason, should we say folks to have subcommittee choice to me by end of next week, or is that too late? Or... Um, yeah, just Do you want to put a deadline on that? Wait, Monday the 28th. End of next week, yeah. It, it's got, yeah. Yeah. It has to be because in. it's December, yeah. right? You know, yeah. Next week is the day. Amy. I, I just wanted to share a comment from someone who's viewing this. Um, Jody Palsgrove says, thank you for broadcasting this meeting. As you went through your committees, I would encourage that you consider the disabled, both physical and developmental, as members. I know a lot of autistic youth that are passionate about history that may be interested in being involved. Oh, great idea. And just one more note. As you are getting closer to adjourning this, um, we would like to just take a photo of everybody where you are. So before you hop out of your seats. I think it's available now. Can this committee organization really come? Get that later. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about the committee structures here. I, I think other people said this, but it seems like communications and municipal outreach are actually the same as to promoting what we're doing, and that Agreed. probably the community so. outreach, which is like this charrette meeting every town model is probably an events and programs thing because oh. rather than thinking about that just occurs to me rather than thinking about those meetings as 
planning process towards this. We might think of the process as the product itself. Great. To have 169 oh. meetings about what America is or ought to be in every town is cooler than what do you want your July 4th party to look like? Right. Um, <laughs> All so anyway, right. I just, yeah. I'm moving the community okay. outreach into events and programs, and I'm moving municipal outreach into communications, and then cutting community municipal outreach as a um, subcommittee, if that makes right. sense. I like that. I like that. So it sounds like there needs to be some communication to all of us about what we're selecting. <laughs> we will not me. Bring no. us all to bear. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut and paste. Yes. And then we'll. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Hopefully, very quickly, so that we can get this yeah. kind of set up by the end of next week, not this week, next week, right? Even though it is Thanksgiving, I get it, but yeah. it'd be nice if you could decide that and get this going. Okay. Is there anything else missing from committees? Right now, anyway. <clears throat> the committees will generally be comprised exclusively of commissioners, correct? I think the, uh, yeah. for the subcommittees, um, we can have outside people as we Yeah, we can necessary. have external people on these on the subcommittees as well. In fact, that might be a really good idea, because one way we were thinking that we could bring more people in yeah. uh, with expertise in that area. So. <laughs> So let us know if you think there are other folks that could be helpful here. There would be tremendous benefit to that because there's people from all the various yeah. communities that we're trying to represent that could touch every yeah. subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we make some um, advisory board or some, something that we can just tell everyone, oh, you're on this 250th thing that can have 700 people on it, every institution represented? Is there some other thing that we should create a line item for that? We did think about that, actually, having an advisory group. And that's why, at first, we're just going to collect all the names, and we will find a place for every. It might be on a subcommittee, might be part of a big advisory council. So it's like telling people, you know, oh, you're on that. Yes. Right. But right now, we're working. We're looking for worker bees right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> there will be plenty of people that want their name on the letterhead. But um, right now, we just need to put a structure in place. But that's a great idea. We did talk about that. Do we want to pick a date right now? I would say the next meeting might be sometime in mid-January. Um, so let's see. So we'll let the, the inaugural ball and the legislature get themselves organized. And um, by then, we'll be in a place where we can talk about um, whatever draft initial report we would have by then. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking midweek sometime, as opposed to, does anybody, I'm, I'm assuming it would be during the day. That works for most people, not evenings. OK. So I don't know, just off the top of my head, how about uh, January 11th? January is when we have lots of holidays, isn't it? Martin Luther King Day is in there somewhere. Anyway, how about how about January 11th? I will not be in Connecticut that day. But Are you? I'll be on vacation. Oh, <laughs> good for you. Can you call in? Yeah, if it's on Zoom, maybe. Well, I didn't know where you, I would I'm going to be in Arizona. You know, if you're going to Antarctica or something, you know. All right. So this is my uh, the King holiday is on the 16th. Yeah, 16th. Um, okay. Right. I can do I can do the 11th. 11th is good. All right. We'll call it for the 11th, and like we'll have same time. Yep, say 10 o'clock. Reserve like 10 to noon, I guess. Um, and, same location. Uh, same location. Sally. Sally, can you host us again? Sure. I'm okay. Sorry. I was, Great. I wasn't exactly paying attention. I definitely cannot be here on oh, yeah. January 11th. Yeah. I have a, pre, a prior commitment. It's racial justice, but yeah. 18. <laughs> Anything after MLK Day is great for me. But how long you gone? How about the 12th? 12th is our meal on a plane. Definitely can't come that day. <laughs> okay. Oh, and it might be worth going to the regional 250th before reconvening. Reconvening. Oh, so what about yeah. the 18th? Yeah. We're, we're being told that the 12th is the regional 250th, and we might want to convene after that as we get more information. So we'll go out a little more to, like, the 18th, 19th? How about the 18th? 18th? Wide open. 
Everybody good on the 18th? Perfect. Okay. All right. January 18th will be the date. Uh, Sally will host us again, 10 to 12. And uh, we'll come back, and hopefully by then we'll have reports from some subcommittees. We'll have some names of affinity groups and all that sort of thing. And we'll be off and running. Thank you very much. This is so exciting. All right. Gavel.